Eugenio.
For short days, he ain't getting nowhere, and he's losing his head. He must have gone crazy out there, Charmin. The reason I got hired here, is that right, Jim? Uh, yeah. It's a little humorous tune that... It's never the things you slave over for three weeks. It's the little thing you're writing about an hour that does something. I don't know why that is in the world of songwriting. Yeah, Charlie here. That's right. So this one out to Charlie or all you fellow gardeners. I have no talent as a gardener, and every year about August I say, that's it, this is my last garden, who am I kidding? And I mean it too, it's just tedious and boring. I think, gosh, this is ridiculous. About $75 invested in each tomato, and then <laughs> overnight a flock of blackbirds will clean you out. There's a lot that can happen to a garden between, you know, the time you plant it and the end. Am I right, gardener? It's well, worse than, yeah. worse than any golfers out there who are just obsessed in that. Then they get you because what happens in February? The cattle Yes. And there's not a blemish on their tomatoes, and there's no worms, there's no nothing. You think, yeah, I could do that, shoot. And they have this great, whoever writes the copy for these catalogs, you know, it's easy. Anyone can grow this. A, a young child can grow this lupus sponge, you know, and it's only, uh, so away I go again. And one winter, I was snowed in, and there was nothing to do but for two weeks, but ski out to the mailbox, which is four miles at my old branch, and, get these seed catalogs, key back and drink a, two pots of coffee and flip through the pages. And You know, I'm not even a shopper, I'm not proud of this, but at the end of two weeks, I had ordered $1,500 worth of bulbs. And I, <laughs> so I, I couldn't even believe I did this. It was like I was in a coma. I forgot about it, because I don't send it right away. And then the next fall, I saw a semi coming down my lane. <laughs> it's a true story. And I, I said, whoa, that guy's lost, because you know, you have to, work to get down that lane and well sure enough it was my tulip and crocus and all my bulbs and I don't know I immediately went on tour and had all my friends plant them for me. <laughs> so here's my little 
this story, and almost everything in here is true. I'm not proud of that, but I bet a few of you have pinned some of these things, too. So. Well, it starts with a catalog that comes in the mail in the middle of the winter, and you've had it with those pale, thick-skinned, store-bought, sorry, hard as rock, excuses for tomatoes with the flavor of a sock, and there on the cover sits the juicy, red, ripe, homegrown tomato you've had dancing in your head. Never mind you said last August that you'd had it up to here with the hoeing and the weeding. That's what you say every year. See, when I wrote this, I thought I was being paid by the word. <laughs> So you fix a cup of cocoa, sink into your favorite chair, put your feet up and your thumb through the pictures and compare. Big boys, better boys, early girls, romas, that new disease and drought resistant hybrid from Sonoma. Then it's on to peas and carrots, lima beans and beets and kale, and you've never tried kohlrabi, say the lettuce is on sale. What's a garden without sweet corn? Better plant some marigolds, and you just read in prevention about how garlic's good for colds. You phone an order in that nearly melts your Visa card Then stare out at the foot of snow that blankets your backyard And visualize your garden oh so peaceful and serene And till at last you close your eyes and slip into a dream about harvest time Bushels of red ripe tomatoes Harvest time Sweet corn that melts in your mouth well, the days turn to weeks, and the next thing you know, there's a robin at the feeder, and the last patch of snow disappears by the time that a UPS truck backs up to your house, and you stand there awestruck as 47 perishable plant right away marked boxes are unloaded on your porch as you say, are you sure? Yes, ma'am, needs your signature here. Looks like someone's going to have them quite the garden this year. Well, you watch him drive away, then you sink to your knees Cause you feel a little woozy, 47 boxes please God, I know I've got a problem and we've had this talk before But help me this one last time, I won't order anymore <laughs> Just then, as if an answer to your prayer Your sister's van pulls up into the driveway With Aunt Martha, Uncle Stan, two nephews and a cousin Who just stopped to say hello But sooner sporting calluses is up and down each row You their warden push him, it's a scene from Cool Hand Luke, over there, those claws ain't breaking. Leave more space around that cube. See that bag of steer manure? Bring a dozen over fast. Yes, I know you have lumbago, but you'll thank me when it lasts. It's harvest time. Bushels of red rag tomatoes. Harvest time. I'll show you what a real strawberry tastes like. Well, that night it starts to sprinkle and you can't help feeling smug cause your garden's in the ground and getting watered while you're snug underneath the covers or at least until midnight when the temperature starts dropping and in no time you're smack right in the middle of your garden in your jammies on your knees with a headlamp and a hammer and some tarps and jeans Louise it's cold but you keep working till the last plan safe from harm and there's holes in your new jammies and bursitis in your own. <laughs> This song is not meant to be done on a moving train. Because <laughs> by God, you're a gardener right down to your muddy clogs. And even when the rabbits take your lettuce and stray dogs pee on your zucchini and fungus goes your kale because it's rained for two weeks solid, do you falter? Do you fail? Yep. You throw your hoe down, stomp your feet, and call it quits. Declare to all the neighborhood that gardening is the pits and you'll never plant another and this one can bloody rot. And suddenly the sun breaks through the clouds and like this night you see a couple weeds you must have missed the last go round. Shake your head and meekly pick your hoe up off the ground and hoe and keep on hoeing till your roma dangle red ripe and juicy on the bun. Sweet corn towers overhead, beans hang from their trellis, big orange pumpkins brawl about and you get that satisfying feeling once more when you shout everybody, harvest time. Man the pressure cooker, harvest time. Where's those cannon jobs? Harvest time. You have to take zucchini, we're related. Harvest time. You know, next year I think I'm gonna grow a loofah sponge. Uh, this is, it just popped into my head that we sang it once. And it's written by a great uh, songwriter, the late, great Towns Van Zandt. Oh, yes. Woo! Rosalie did a version of it. It's called, it's appropriate, it's called Snowing on Raton. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. That's got a great chorus to sing along. Come snowing on Raton. Come morning, we'll be through these hills and gone. Absolutely. Do that in my period. It's a beautiful song. Towns was a real poet. There's a movie out about it now. It's a good song about being on the road. A troubadour song. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, he, he did. He of loved course. being on the road. He never wrote anything about how awful it was to be on the road. He loved, he loved it. <laughs> when the wind don't blow in Amarillo and the moon along the gutter sand don't blow, shall I cast my dreams on your love, babe? Lie beneath the laughter of your eyes Snowing on rushed home Come morning I'll be through these hills and gone You're snowing on rushed home Come morning I'll be through these hills and gone my mama thinks the road is hard and lonely. My little brother thinks the road is straight and fine. My baby thinks the road is soft and lovely. Well, I'm just thankful this old road is a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so Goodbye. You cannot steal it. You cannot turn the circles of the sun. You cannot count the miles until you feel them. You cannot hold a lover that is gone. Snow. will be sleeping. Silent. Neither a black and green and blue. But I can hear the silence you are keeping. They'll bring all their promises to you. We, uh, we're going to do a song by request somebody wanted to hear right in the High Line. The High Line was uh, the, uh, the great northern uh, railway that went through northern Montana. I was born and raised up north of Conrad, and uh, that's the High Line area. So if you were born on the northern tier, or if you lived on the northern tier of Montana, you were called a High Liner. And we have a song called Ride in the High Line. A one, two, three, two, two. <laughs>
me out of that stage and it was embarrassing and stupid I didn't like that part but the rest of it was great so we started trying to get up there and we couldn't get there at all and he, he hustled somebody into letting us getting us a, a helicopter ride and they were using military helicopters to kind of have two uh, whirly gigs and, and they have a great big door like uh, like a freight train and a huge sliding doors on the side for moving troops. And they were moving us up there. And I went in with uh, John Sebastian and, and uh, from the Loving Spoonful and this other Brit group, I can't remember the name of them now. But they're, they were pretty well known then. They're very very odd and I, I can't just can't remember the name of it but anyhow I'd never been in a helicopter before I thought it was just wonderful I mean you can hang there and you can stop you know way up above and we could see them all coming we could see four rivers of people coming from all these different directions and then we could see a huge huge swath of, of tents where everybody was camping and this, and this mound where there were already about 150,000 people on there when we first got there we got there right by the time they finished there were 500,000 people there I don't care what anybody tells you there were <laughs> and, and the, so we were flying in in the helicopter and, and somebody I don't know how they talked me into this I must have been drunk or something <laughs> I have vertigo. I'm scared of heights, but they they uh, wrapped me up in a a netting, 
and I stood on the edge of the the door and I leaned all the way out about 45 degrees so I could see everything and I wasn't afraid that's see I must have been really stoned <laughs> anyhow then we came down and I got out of the helicopter and who do I see I see Arlo Guthrie and Ravi Shankar and Jerry Garcia and everywhere I looked, there's somebody like that. And I got to be in the back where all the performers were, although I, I didn't come there to perform, but this guy was trying to hustle me on the stage. And uh, we had this incredible jam session with uh, with Jerry, and who I, I knew pretty well. He lived close to where I live. And, and uh, oh, David Brownberg was, David Brownberg came there to play with me then, and he, so he was there, and there, there were four or five other really great players, and, we were, and it was raining, and I was singing If I Could Be the Rain, and a whole bunch of uh, different news guys took foot, footage of that because it seemed so appropriate on account it was raining, you know, and I was singing that, and so you see all the rain coming down behind me, and I'm singing that in their play. But uh, my favorite thing was when after about three days, nobody had a bath, and it rained and rained and rained, and we were all back in the back, and it started pouring, and, and we were sitting and jamming with Shana and I, and we ran to get in their sound truck, which was huge, it was like a big room, it was almost as big as this, this place, <laughs> and we were sitting in there, all soaking wet, looking out of the big window, and there was a, a chain link fence and about 500 naked people appeared. Because they were all naked and they had soap and they were all washing themselves like taking a giant shower. And the water was pouring down and we sat there looking at them, you know, just kind of... And then it stopped raining and they disappeared. And everybody sat there kind of looking at them and not looking at each other and finally somebody turned around and said, did you see that? <laughs> And it's like that everywhere. I felt like Alice in Wonderland or something. Every time I turned around, there was somebody really famous sitting there. You know, it was it was really an amazing experience, and, and the music was fabulous. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard of a, about a television special documentary. Oh yeah, Idaho Public Television did a documentary of a. a a live performance I did in Ketchum, Idaho, and, and it's called Way Out in Idaho, like the book. And uh, uh, National Public Television has picked it up and they're going to show it in May. And it actually will be available on my website too. I have a DVD of that. I just, it's not, uh, it hasn't been put on yet, but it will be in the next week. So you can, you can buy things, uh, my things from the website which is also called Way Out in Idaho. <laughs> That's my business name, Way Out in Idaho. Any other last questions before we let Rosalie go? Here. She's going to open the concert show tonight, so we don't want to burn her out. Did you ever hang out at the Cedar Tavern? Most painters were there, like de Kooning. Yeah, yeah. I'm real interested in that. But that's a whole other story. What about Ramblin' Jack? Oh, Ramblin'. In two, <laughs> in, in two in words ten or less? minutes. Yes. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> well, I, I met him uh, when I lived in Salt Lake. I, I started a concert series. I never thought I was going to go anywhere, so so I wanted to bring them there, and I did. I brought a whole lot of people in. Ramblin' Jack was one of them. We got to be friends. We've been friends for years, and uh, Sun House came too. <laughs> And uh, my favorite, Jesse the Lone Cat Fuller. <laughs> one man band. The one man band, yeah. Gene Ritchie. I, that's how I met a lot of those people. The folk music. It was the, the great folk scare, as Phillips likes to call it. <laughs> Let's see. I, I, I'll just sing you one to end up. Um, I really wanted to do this. Now, do you see my leather book in here? It's got a piece of gold in there. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. I want to do this because it is so Idaho. I'd just like to tell you that Idaho is not. I, 
Idaho is, is complicated. They are extremely conservative and it is election day, so I think I should do something political in this time. Yes. <laughs> it is by my friend Gino Skye, who is a true beat uh, generation person and uh, a really great writer. And the thing about Idaho is they don't like to talk about directly about politics. They particularly don't like it if you bring up something that, that like health care or something, you know, that, that uh, involves giving people money because they need it. They really believe that they have a whole John Wayne attitude. I have it too, you know. I said, no, no, I can do this myself. You know, I can. This is not true. You can't do it yourself. And it's, that's, you know, come to my attention, that's stupid. <laughs> But I would never tell them that. I, they're wonderful people, but but you can't just bring it up. You have to hide it. You have to sneak up on it. So this piece, which my friend Gene Oskai wrote, is appears to be about a truck, but it's really about health care, and uh, and it has come to my attention that you sell us almost anything if you put it in a truck. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's called dignity. And I'll follow it with a, a talking blues by my friend Patrick Sky, who is not related to my friend Gino Sky, about something they hate to talk about even more, which is death. They get up and walk out of the room when you talk about that. And he's scared of it, you know. <laughs> Dignity. The old truck we used to bring in our winter wood didn't have a driver's side window. The heater was broken, and the brakes only seemed to take a hold just before going over the low side. As a matter of choice, Grandpa always waited until the first snow to go out and haul in the wood, because he thought it would be showing off if he brought it in too early. Many a time I thought my fingers and toes would crack off from riding in that cab or that Grandpa would roll the truck on a hairpin curve with five cords of wood in the back. But we loved that truck no matter what. And after the wood was in, we would let it rest all winter long. Almost every farm in Idaho has a truck like that. Bald tires, leaky radiator that's fixed by adding a a box of Quaker oatmeal. The windshield wipers were gone and they could not be replaced. No one remembered what happened to the title and there was never any insurance. But somehow it always got the job done and after the last cord of wood was stacked, we hunkered around a barrel fire, drank coffee or cocoa, and somebody would always say, what a great truck. <laughs> It's the same way some of us deal with our health problems. Like that old truck we limp around long and most of the time the job gets done. No spares. Some parts missing. But we keep on running. After World War II, almost everyone was able to have health insurance. It didn't cost that much. People started living longer. Doctors got rich, but that was all right. It was called investing in the quality of life, and the money was worth it. But some time ago, it all changed. Most of my friends can't afford the exorbitant prices of health insurance. And having a baby in the hospital went from $150 to $6,000 in one generation. <clears throat> it's become a no-win situation. We're stuck with what our bodies decide to do. We joke about marrying a Canadian for that country's health insurance, but that's about as far as it's gone. Once again, it's like having that old truck back. If something breaks, we live with it. If it conks out, all we can do is celebrate. Having dignity as our only insurance, that's what we toast when our friends go over the low side. Hick, and I don't mean to make you sick, but I got a few words that I would like to say. It's about this undertaker man who told me that he had a plan to put me into the ground on layaway. All started about a year ago. I met this doctor in Idaho, and he told me I really had it bad. <laughs> 
said, girl, your legs are turning blue And if the same as a killing you And he told me about a year was all I had well, folks, as you can plainly see That scared the hell right out of me And for about a month I really had the blues Then one fine day I took a look And sure enough in my phone book There's a sign right there that said Come in and choose Joe's Undertakers, we got lots of coffins, grass, and burial plots, and we fix faces back the way they came. Formaldehyde or alcohol, hell, we'll pick on you and had a call. And black or white to us, you all the same. So I went right in and I sat right down, and pretty soon this man come around, he said he'd like to take some measurements. <laughs> him and I said okay he commenced in measuring right away he measured nineteen hundred dollars and fifteen cents <laughs> well folks as you can plainly see I'm about as healthy as a girl can be and that doctor he just sits there wondering why and I look at him and I say doc this may come to you as quite a shock but the plain truth is I can't afford to die <laughs>